They say when you speak, you should know your audience, and so I'm gonna ask a few questions. You guys can just respond with your hands, and I'll give you some idea of uh, where your heads are at with respect to uh, where the talk is gonna go. So, how many people own a mobile device? Could you just kind of raise your hands? That's kind of an obvious question. Um, how many people own an iPhone or an Android device? Cool, right. kind of what I expected. Um, how many people have ever owned a mobile device where they had to pull an antenna out of it before they started using it? Wow, okay, that's a lot more than I thought. Pretty good. Um, so, this talk ought to resonate with most of you because I'm gonna kind of go through a little bit of the history of mobility, specifically mobile data, and specifically in the US, and demonstrate how there have been some pretty interesting inflection points over the last 12 years, but uh, give you a sense of where it stands today and why I believe that's a significant opportunity specifically for Erlen. So that's kind of the story I'm gonna tell and hopefully it uh, inspires all the Erlen developers to go out and start building software that will help the US mobile industry, which I think will demonstrate is gonna need that help. So going way back to year 2000, seems strange to say 2000 way back, but it is, especially uh, with respect to the mobile industry, um, it's kind of the unofficial birth of mobile data in the U.S. So, theoretically, the first mobile application that was launched in the U.S. was something called Pocket. Um, it was in the late 1990s. It was launched by the newly formed AT&T wireless company that was formerly the Qua Cellular. And it was a horrible failure. I mean, nobody, nobody really bought it, nobody really used it, and it really doesn't represent, in my mind, kind of the birth of mobile data because it was a significant misstep. Um, but it did have one success tied to it, um, and it's not the fact that they had to switch, a little switch on the phone to go from voice mode to data mode. That's how it worked, and I see if somebody remembers that. Um, it's that it got the attention of a company called Docomo from Japan. And, uh, and so they came over to, uh, the Seattle area, where at and Wireless was headquartered, and looked very intently into what was being done with PocketNet, um, extra extrapolated from that the whole concept of sort of a mobile internet, went back to Japan and very quickly, quickly a couple of years, launched something called iMo, which was probably the first significant global mobile data service ever launched. Um, after the success of iMode, they came back to the US and decided that they wanted to help encourage the US marketplace to also retry to launch mobile data. And so they came back to the company that, uh, that kind of started it for them with PocketNet um, and delivered this nice little $10 billion gift uh, right on top of the lap of AT&T Wireless. With that $10 billion, what Pokemon wanted was three things. They wanted AT&T Wireless to be the first carrier in the US to launch 3G. It's called UMTS at the time. They wanted AT&T Wireless to launch something equivalent to iMode in terms of a data service, a data portal. And they wanted AT&T Wireless to form a separate division within the company focused just on mobile data services called Mobile Multimedia Services. That's where I started my mobile career, um, at AT&T Wireless in the Mobile Multimedia Services space, my responsibility being to launch the first US data portal that would, at least in intent, simulate what Docomo did with iPhone. So, at that point in time, mobile data was born. That $10 billion was the sort of infusion that required, that was required for carriers to feel comfortable that they can kind of try again in launching mobile data in the US. So it was successful. I mean, it, it didn't just drive sort of mobile internet usage. It drove a huge uptick in text messaging, in all sorts of interesting services on top of the portal, things like finding things nearby, so location-based services, um, new, new ways to interact with kind of pools of friends um, that you can sort of maintain inside the portal. Uh, email, 
became much easier. So uh, we didn't call it IMO, we called it MMO. And it was the first sort of legitimate US mobile data service that was launched. And it was fairly successful. I mean, for $12.49, you could get a whopping two megabytes of data per month. Amazing. Um, that light there. Um, also, uh, one of the things that the mobile multimedia group did at at and Wireless was they kind of brought text messaging mainstream. And one of the ways they did that was they partnered with American Idol, which was this sort of brand new show that was just wildly popular in the US. Um, and they introduced this concept of text voting. And uh, the first time they engaged in that, that was season two, there was eight million votes cast as part of, uh, as part of that initiative. By the time they got to season eight, there was almost 180 million votes being cast through text messaging. So wildly popular, and we all know what's happened to text messaging in the US has just exploded worldwide as well. But all of this success brought the need for scale. And uh, scale that, honestly, we weren't very well prepared for when we set about on this course. So the, the sort of early dynamics around how we had to scale and what we had to scale is this list here. It's not the full list, but it's representative. So for Emlo, um, it, it was basically uh, all web technology. So uh, at the heyday of the, the system, we were approaching 15 million users. Uh, it was built on Apache Tomcat, EA WebLogic, Oracle, and lots of Java code. And the obvious way to scale that was buy lots of hardware, put load balancers in front, and distribute that wasn't the only thing we needed to do. There was this WAP gateway that needed to scale equally. WAP was the early wireless protocol for the internet, and uh, it was effectively a web proxy. And then there was the components within the packet core of the network was things that make uh, radio communication actually appear to be IP communication when it gets into this part of the network. And the SGSN and the GTSN do those things in a 2G and 3G mobile network. And then, of course, the messaging infrastructure. So SMSCs are the things that make SMS messages uh, basically work inside this network. So there's a subset of the components that needed to scale just to, to match the success we were having with that mode and with messaging. And they all needed to scale sort of independently. They were their own sort of systems, and they all had their own dynamics, and they all presented this interesting dilemma about how to scale. So, I remember the, the uh, executive vice president of uh, Mobile Multimedia Services when kind of faced with this uh, dilemma, and of course he heard from every group involved that it meant more and more hardware and more and more space to store that hardware and more and more places to put that for geographic diversity. And his comments was interesting. He said, "Well, if this continues. We're going to need a, you know a, a data center the size of Safeco Field." And uh, those who don't know, Safeco, Safeco Field is about this big, well, not that big on the screen. It's big. Um, it's the, the baseball stadium in Seattle. And of course, his perspective was, you know, if the answer to scale is always going to be more and more hardware, then the more this grows, the more this succeeds, the more space we're going to need to house that hardware and be used to Safeco Field as the example. But it didn't really net out that way, and, and there's, there's a good reason why. The, um, the carriers really kept their arms very tightly around their data services. They, uh, there was a term called the wall guard back in the day. I don't know if anyone's familiar with that term. But it was essentially carriers restricting where you could go when you got into sort of the whole internet that they controlled and they ran. So before the iPhone, <coughs> Operators were hurting their subscribers into these walled gardens. And a lot of the standards that were being driven to enable these capabilities and mobility were created for the benefit of the operator, not for the subscriber. The operators were the ones paying for it, um, ultimately. But then after the iPhone, tremendous shift occurs. Um, Apple has the dramatic effect of shifting the focus away from the operator and away from the device manufacturers and onto the customer and onto the developer. And so 
they focus on customer experience, they focus on enabling developers very effectively with things like this rich SDK and, and the App Store, or a way to monetize what they build. And they changed the game, and they changed the game forever. Um, their approach to the mobile internet was not specific mobile protocols like WAP or XHTML, it was, hey, you're gonna be able to develop like you would for any other web system. Um, full-blown HTML, full fidelity, right? And as a result, the operator that was always the pipe, but was trying to be sort of controlling having that pipe, becomes the, the dump pipe in the process. They lose complete control over how they had built up this market, and this, this industry up to this point. The thing they hadn't prepared for is the dramatic impact that Apple's approach would have on their network. And so for those that remember the first launch of the iPhone, AT&T's network was getting killed. They did not size the network for the, the type of volume of traffic the iPhone was going to bring to the table. So Apple really upsets the operator's cart as a result. And um, you know, gone are the, the managed portals to web content. Gone are the, the operator's revenue streams for wallpapers and ringtones and games and apps. Um, all sold through their own branded storefronts. Gone are the, the incremental revenue uh, that those brought beyond sort of the, the, the mobile service. And it, it used to be where device manufacturers, and Apple's a device manufacturer really, uh, when they started, it used to be the device manufacturers would sort of have to brand the operator's experience onto their device, which meant they took the back seat. Apple changes that completely as well. Apple is very much in the driver's seat with respect to their products. So, you know, they brought full fidelity web browsing to mobile. And, uh, and they replaced the, uh, the operator's storefronts with, you know, iTunes and App Store. Um, and they made tremendous revenue as a result. We've all seen what Apple's stock's doing and their 100 billion they've got in the bank. This is largely why. Um, and the operators, again, become relegated to, uh, to the dump pipe. Now, it didn't happen immediately. Um, you know, the operators would cling for some amount of time to their feature phones and, and the, uh, the portals and the storefronts that they could offer on those. But it really was the beginning of the end. And so the operator's focus now is largely on providing the best network they can. And that presents a significant amount of challenge. But going back to Safeco Field, as it turns out, that EVP and at AT&T Wireless wasn't all that off base when he said if this continues, we're going to need something the size of Safeco Field. In fact, other companies that have this sort of scale problem, like Google, right? They've got a facility in Oregon that's well, this one down here, over 200,000 square feet. Facebook, also in Oregon, I think right across the street from Google's actually, is over 300. Uh, thousand square feet. Apple's just built their data center, which houses iTunes um, and the App Store in North Carolina at uh, 500,000 square feet. So I checked. They're not quite Safeco Field. Safeco Field technically is over a million square feet. Um, but if you just count the turf, which might have been what he was thinking about, it's only 100,000 square feet. So. Suffice to say, he was very prophetic in recognizing that we're going to need something the size of Safeco Field to support this. And in fact, uh, Apple has had to build something pretty much to that scale. So, so Apple with iOS, and of course what quickly followed, and has now surpassed, which is Android, have, uh, have brought at least the two largest US carriers into a fairly prestigious circle. I've called the 100 million club. Um, as of the, the past year, both dominated US carriers have surpassed 100 million subscribers. So both AT&T and Verizon have over 100 million subscribers. And um, combined, they have more than 100 million smartphones, which are by far the largest consumers from a device perspective of mobile data services. And so network bandwidth, being consumed 
at a phenomenal rate, and network utilization, which used to be a concern of operators, is no longer a concern in terms of underutilization. Now it's how can I build more fast enough to meet the demand as well. So scalability is no longer addressed in terms of you know millions. It's not even tens of millions now. Operators are looking at scalability in terms of hundreds of millions. And uh, I'll show you how that's going to progress. So that presents a problem. I, mean, I mentioned how the revenue streams have gone away and how the operators have been pushed basically being light. Um, and there's been this inflection point now, I think, uh, within the last year, data services have exceeded voice services and mobility worldwide. And so that presents a pretty significant problem for a business that obviously needs to have revenues that exceed costs. The big dilemma in mobility today is the traffic is growing exponentially. The revenue streams are all but reduced to providing connectivity or providing a mobile service. And the costs associated to building up the network at a rate to keep up with the traffic are starting to exceed, if not already exceeding, the revenues that will be available from that traffic. And that's a huge problem because no business can sustain that. No business can sustain costs that outweigh revenues for a long period of time. Now, businesses can make the investments, which are what the operators are doing, hoping to get paid out of those investments, but they have to be very careful what investments they make. They have to be very careful that they, they don't fall into this, this thing called the scissor effect, which is you know, the, the bane of, of the, the mobile industry. This is what they seek to avoid. But it's the reality of where things are right now. And so there's a tremendous amount of uh, motivation for mobile operators to avoid this. And I'm going to talk about how they hope to do that, and where I think that nets out in terms of opportunity. Any questions up to this point? Everybody still tracking? Cool. So what's an operator to do when faced with this scissor effect? Well, clearly they can't continue down this path, right? Clearly they have to find a way to either lower the cost or increase revenue. Or both, ideally. Um, the margins, again, are under tremendous pressure. Network efficiency is absolutely key. You can build a network that can do more with less. You can solve this problem. Um, so, how have they tried to manage network utilization today? Well, if you follow any of the press, you've probably seen these things referenced. Um, and in a lot of cases, you probably see it referenced in the context of a lawsuit being taken against an operator. Um, AT and T and Verizon, for the longest time, initially with the launch of the iPhone, sold unlimited data plans. Now, they were never truly unlimited, but the prospect was you could never use enough data to, to sort of blow out your, your cap, and so go for it. We'll call it unlimited, and we'll charge it as such. Well, all of those plans are gone. They don't sell them anymore, and there's two reasons why they don't. First, people really can do a significant amount of damage to a mobile network by being a high-volume data user. I think I read it. A statistic somewhere specifically for AT&T, where one percent, the highest one percent of data users represented thirty-six percent of the overall network utilization. It's pretty extreme. Um, and so you can imagine what an operator would have to do in those circumstances. Well, obviously they could do away with unlimited plans, but they also have to throttle excessive users, and they've done that. And some of those users have fought back and and taking legal action against the companies as a result. They also throttle undesirable services. So early on, when people were trying to run Skype over the mobile uh, data, they would, uh, they would prevent that. They would just block it completely. Um, Verizon's opened that up now. They're, they're, Verizon's sort of embracing being in the pipe from that perspective. But, there are other things they, they still throttle, you know, peer-to-peer uh, -peer file sharing. That's always going to be slow because it's it's purposefully throttled inside the normal network. Um, it has a, the effect of just gobbling up bandwidth. So today, the operators are restricting behavior in order to control the utilization of their network. But what they really have to do is figure out how to build more. 
how to build more capacity to meet the ever increasing demand. There are four key ways they can do that, and they're not mutually exclusive. In fact, they probably need to pursue all four. There are certainly challenges to, uh, to all of them. Those four are boost network capacity, so more throughput, um, and that's based on what they initially hold in terms of spectrum. They can also acquire more spectrum, so then they can build more on top of the new spectrum. They can increase the network intelligence in ways to uh, sort of guide how particular services use their network in a way that they can kind of balance how that utilization occurs over a 24-hour period. And then the last is to deploy new network infrastructure that's more efficient. So I'll talk about each of these a little bit. Um, network capacity is clearly challenged. Um, I think Chuck, you might, have, you might have coined this term in one of our discussions, but spectrum, unlike money, you can't print more of. Um, and that's absolutely true. There's a limited amount of spectrum. And right now, the operators in the US hold the following uh, chunks of spectrum in each of these three categories. But the, the reality is, it's really not a lot. I mean, if you look at it, Clearwire is holding the most spectrum in the US. I mean, how many people have Clearwire in service? I mean, nobody in the room, probably a huge crowd, but um, if Clearwire never succeeds with their YMAX, their value in terms of the spectrum they hold is, is phenomenal. Uh, but the carriers are very much limited by the amount of spectrum that they hold today. In fact, I think Verizon just told the FCC, because Verizon's in the process of trying to, uh, to piggyback off of cable company spectrum, they told the FCC that uh, starting next year, they will be out of capacity. They will start to be out of capacity. By the year 2015, they will be completely out of capacity. So unless there's more spectrum made available to them, their network will reach its max. So it's not clear that the operators believe their current spectrum holdings are going to get them over the hump. So what's the next thing to do? Well, the next thing to do is to try to get more spectrum. If you've ever seen this chart, it's pretty daunting. But this is literally the state of spectrum in the US. So the FCC manages uh, how this spectrum is ultimately allocated. Uh, and they auction off portions that they can free up. But if you look at it, there's, there's really not a whole lot screaming out, I'm available, I'm getting it. All of his spectrum is purposed in some way, shape, or form. And these kind of two middle bars are the, the sort of best spectrum for mobile operators as they move to, uh, to 4G. And there's just, there's not a lot there. And there's not a lot um, for them to get their hands on in a meaningful way. The only way really to get more spectrum is to free it up. So, you know, past things have been done to do that. If you remember the old UHF band on your TV, you can't get that anywhere. That spectrum has been redeployed into the mobile industry. And, um, you know, when you hear things like AT&T wants to acquire T-Mobile for its spectrum, they're literally willing to take a company, an existing company like T-Mobile, buy it for several tens of billions of dollars, throw everything away, and just keep the spectrum. That's how badly they need spectrum. Of course, that didn't succeed. And uh, as a result, I think they did a little sort of spectrum swap there, um, as well as paying penalty. But it's incredibly challenging to try to get more spectrum. So it's not clear that that's going to be the way to solve this problem. A little bit more on the spectrum dilemma. Um, and this is specific to sort of compare the US to, to other countries. Um, if you look here, this is sort of what they call efficient use of spectrum. It's the number of subscribers served per megahertz of spectrum. In the US, the operators are easily two times any other country listed here in terms of the amount of subscribers per megahertz of spectrum. So they're already significantly more saturated than the rest of the world. And if you look at the available potential spectrum in the pipeline, there's only 50 megahertz available to them versus the rest of the world, which has easily three, four, five times that. So spectrum's going to be a huge issue, and there's really not a lot we can do in this room to solve that. So 
So we'll move on to some of these other areas where eventually we can help mobile operators get out of this issue they have. So network intelligence, I, I say theoretically speaking because right now the networks are not very intelligent. Um, but there's this concept of, of becoming a smart pipe, and it's, it's a clever term because everybody calls operators dumb pipes. Um, and their counter is, well, we're going to become a smart pipe, and that's going to give us all the money we need to overcome the scissor effect. And I'm not bought into that concept, but there is something to be said for network intelligence. Eh? It's largely to help operators manage their networks effectively, and if they can manage them more effectively, I think that they can squeeze additional um, capability and capacity out of those networks. But as I said before, right now, the way they're doing that the level of intelligence they've implemented is something called deep packet inspection. So they look into the packets that flow through the, the packet core, and they make decisions about how that traffic should be treated. And right now, it's almost always prohibited. So it's almost always identifying the stuff that they want to slow down or stop completely. That goes for services as well as users. So the problem with this approach to network intelligence is, although it helps them manage their network more intelligently. Does it really net out in customers that ultimately will want to pay for their services? Probably not. I mean, the bad press associated to unlimited plans not really being unlimited, people who thought they were buying unlimited but got throttled, but that's clearly not positive press for, for operators. And so I'm not sure there's a ton of things they can do near term on the network intelligence side of things to solve their problem. Which brings us to the last option they have. And it sheds a little light into why the operators are doing what they're doing. And so uh, the last option was build new infrastructure. And uh, if you're in the US, you know pretty clearly that there's been sort of a, a war of marketing around 4G and or LTE. Um, in fact, as it turns out, the US is ahead of the rest of the world respect to 4G. Um, although US carriers were way behind in getting to 3G, 87% um, of the LTE users worldwide are in the US. And the build-out's happening at an absolutely furious pace. And there's, there's good reason for it, and it's really not a lot to do with you as a customer. But everything to do with their need to build capacity and do so cost-effectively. So when you hear LTE, you know, there's, there's definitely some confusion in the marketplace as to what that is. Um, it's based on the specification from the 3GPP, which is the standards body that drives these things for the mobile industry. And although it's being sold in the US as 4G, technically it doesn't meet the definition of 4G. Technically it's about 3.9G, but Operators like to round up, so we'll call it 4G. Um, but AT&T, interestingly enough, is selling something called 4G that's not LTE. It's actually something called HSPA+, Plus, which is an increment on top of 3G that drives bandwidth fairly comparable, actually, to what Verizon is launching in LTE. So when you see 4G now in the US, it means something different than what it actually means uh, per the 3 gpp definition. And so you're getting, you know, HSPA plus being sold as 4G and uh, an LTE being sold as 4G. There's actually a specification called LTE Advanced, which does meet the definition of 4G. And, uh, and so you'll, you'll probably see that on the horizon. But this is where things stand today. So what is it? Well, it's, it's certainly faster than 3G, right? I mean, whether it's LTE or HSPA plus, it's faster. Three to five times faster. Um, and it's also, and this is the key for the operators, it's a simplified all IP architecture. So if you look at the way the architecture run a mobile operator's network today in the 3G world exists, it's very complicated. And what LTE does is simplifies it dramatically. Um, and as a result, being all IP, it opens up a significant amount of opportunity to do things they couldn't do before, but 
it also creates significant cost efficiencies, and that's what's key to the operator. They can, by implementing LTE, cut the cost to one third of what it is today per megabyte. Now, cost savings is great, but again, they can also get probably at least four, maybe five times the amount of capacity out of the, the network. So by implementing LTE, they can get almost a fourfold increase in capacity and uh, a reduction to one third of the cost. Pretty significantly motivating. I mean, it's the way they have to go. And so that's why there's a big push, and tremendous investment taking place in the US around LTE. So uh, you might scratch your, scratch your head and say, well, why wouldn't Verizon go to HSPA Plus? Well, they couldn't. Um, their 3G implementation was built on EBDO, which is not um, upgradable to HSPA Plus, versus AT&T, which is on WCDMA, which was upgradable to HSPA Plus. So AT&T has somewhat of an easier time in that um, they can upgrade their existing infrastructure to get to their definition of 4G. Verizon has to roll out a significant amount of new infrastructure, which they've been doing, and they've had a head start and they're clearly the leader in the U.S. around uh, LTE today. Uh, but at and is launching LTE as well in select cities near you. Um, is that my content? There you go. Um, so, I guess the bottom line is, is LTE something that you want or something that they need? And the answer is both. I mean, everybody wants a better mobile experience, and LTE will bring that. Um, but don't for a minute think they're doing this because of you. This is absolutely critical for their ability to succeed and meet the demands that are being placed on their network going forward. So there's two main components to LTE. One is the, the radio access network, which is this long set of words that actually have acronyms that get reduced to acronyms or whatever. But um, the key piece, sort of crown jewel, is this thing called the, the evolved packet core. And that's sits right in the middle of an LTE implementation and makes the whole thing work. It basically is the conduit between the devices and the whole new IP infrastructure that's being deployed as a result. Um, the same time they're implementing this, they are implementing, have been implementing for about the last five years, something called IMS, IP Multimedia Subsystem, which isn't necessarily mobile-centric, it's being driven from the needs of mobility, but the intent of IMS is to provide support for any and all IP-based multimedia services. So one of the interesting dynamics here, I'm not sure how much people have really thought through this inside the, the, the operator space, is VoIP. IMS clearly enables VoIP. And if you're moving your mobile infrastructure to all IP, then you can do voice over IP over mobility as an operator and supplant your own mobile services with something more cost effective. But here's the dilemma, right? They're already struggling keeping up with the demand for the data. If they're gonna then swap out their voice capability and basically make voice a data service, their problem just got that much more difficult to solve. So how are they gonna solve it? Well, that's really the question. Wait, there we go. Um, and it's, it's, as I started out saying, it's a hundred billion problem they've got. And, uh, and that's not dollars because it's probably closer to the billions in terms of what it's gonna cost. But the EPC has a bunch of pretty critical functions. Policy enforcement, packet filtering, flow-based charging, session management. Those were the four key capabilities. Uh, the last one here, diameter routing, is something that's come about after the fact. Um, diameter is the protocol that is implemented as a result of implementing the EPC. What they found is the very complicated uh, interfaces um, and interactions between those four capabilities, you don't have something in the middle routing. So they've already introduced new componentry, diameter routing being one of those, to help allow this to scale more effectively. But all of these functions need to scale to 100 million users just to start. That's the starting point. Um, 
then they need to be able to scale clearly well beyond that. And it's absolutely essential that what they build in, in the Evolve Packet Core can scale in the hundreds of millions. And uh, as you'll see, it's, it's not going very well. Um, they, they, have, they are moving to commodity hardware, and they are doing that with the hopes that everybody is hoping with respect to commodity hardware, which is the chipsets are going to continue to get uh, more performant, and that the cores on those chipsets will grow in terms of density. So they appear to be on the throw hardware at an approach, which, you know, that's great if you've got the software that can leverage it, but if you don't, it doesn't, it doesn't work. So, my prediction now, anybody in the operator space in the room? That's good. Um, <laughs> I'm not anymore. Uh, how they will try and fail to scale. Um, they're going to implement the current state of technologies. And to be clear, operators work with a handful of key domain vendors, typically that are sort of in the networking space, companies like Cisco and uh, Juniper and F5. Um, but those companies really don't even have the EPC capabilities in their product suites. So they're they're getting those technologies from other companies like OpenNet and Traffix and Tycolab and other companies that have had the foresight to build these capabilities. Um, and that's what they said today. They've implemented these technologies and they're finding they don't scale. So they're blaming the vendors because that's what they do. And they're attempting to solve the problem by throwing hardware at it. Um, but even that is not solving the problem. So they continue to blame the vendors. And um, at least one operator is attempting to, I don't know if they're attempting to solve the scale problem or at least control the effect of it, but they're attempting to virtualize uh, each of these functions in the EPC, with the theory being you can kind of isolate the problems a failed function might create for it to, to go down. If anybody's been using LTE on Verizon, you know over the last six months, I think they've had about three or four significant nationwide outages. Not good, but this is why. Um, so what are they going to do? What, I mean, if hardware's not the answer, if virtualization probably isn't, and the vendors aren't delivering solutions that solve this problem, then, then what's the answer? And that's what gets us to the opportunity slide, which is operators need to and want very badly to, to avoid this scissor effect. Um, they have to build out this new network infrastructure. They have to build out the functions inside the EPC. They have to build services that are more intelligent. But there's a lack of stable, reliable, stable, scalable solutions today. So now is the time to rethink the approach. And to be clear, I don't think the operators are really focused on rethinking it. They're very dependent upon software developers and system developers and solution developers to create things um, and bring those through their pool of vendors in order to, to, uh, to adopt uh, new technology. So you're not going to be able to sell Erlang, per se, to a mobile operator. However, you can sell them a policy engine that's built on Erlang or a diameter router that's built on Erlang. I don't have to tell them what it's built on, but if it can scale, they'll buy it. So, it's really not an unobvious question. How do you deliver network-based software services that can scale to meet the needs of hundreds of millions of voracious users and leverage this investment operators have made in multi-core, multi-prop hardware? From my perspective, Erlang is a technology that can do that. And there's a significant opportunity um, that I see firsthand untapped to build these types of functions, these types of capabilities that are absolutely critical to the ultimate success of mobile operators on a technology like Erlang, which seems to have the right dimensions to fit the problem. And I'm not here to say it's the right solution for everything, but I do see kind of a gap between the demand for scalable solutions and things being produced in Erlang to address that demand. So I'm here to promote building these things in our life. I'm almost out of time. I got one more slide, Chuck, and then you can kick me off the stage. <laughs> um, looking forward beyond of all the content I've thrown at you around where we've been and how we got to the 100 billion problem today,
today is this perspective of where it's going. And, um, there's this concept of sort of subscriber saturation, which says, you know, once you've sold a device to every man, woman, and child, and in some cases that uh, pets, um, in the US, uh, demand on the network will start to diminish. That's simply not true. Um, there will be growth beyond subscribers. There are now very many cases of subscribers with multiple mobile devices. So you've got an iPad and an iPhone, you've got two, right? Um, there are emerging devices like telematics and now mobile gaming devices. Um, and machine to machine, you know, smart metering, inventory and fleet management devices, these all add additional load onto the network. And so the problem within the next less than five years isn't going to be a hundred billion problem, it's going to be a five hundred billion problem. So that doesn't underscore the need for scale here. I don't know what will. Um, the other interesting point I'll leave you with is this isn't just going to be about wireless in the future. Uh, once they solve this problem and they have an effectively built and running EPC and an IMS core, fixed wireless and wireline will move there as well. And so almost all networking from an operator's perspective will have to flow through these systems, through these functions, which you can imagine will raise that 500 million problem even higher. So, that's the end of my talk, that's the end of my time. I appreciate you guys listening. If you have any questions, I'll be lingering here afterwards. Thank you very much.
and say, go talk to the vendors that have those solutions today that are getting blamed by the operators for not being able to deliver solutions that can scale and try to find a way to help them through the use of Erlang improve their products. That's probably the easiest path today. I mean, if, if you could rally all of the resources that were at this conference for the next six months and build a new PCR app, you know, you might be able to knock the mobile industry globally you know, on its, on its butt, but that's just not realistic. Uh, and so I think you know, the reality is you're gonna have to first understand the problem, uh, understand the, the space, how you go about solving some of these things, and then work with vendors that are right now trying to solve those. Um, a lot of these companies are, are coming out of a world where they had purpose-built hardware um, and they're trying to deploy that into this world. But the operators have invested tremendous amounts of money in commodity hardware. They're all operating cloud services as part of their infrastructure, which meant they built out tremendous infrastructure that they want to just sell in terms of computing cycles to people. They also want to use that themselves. And so if you can provide them a solution that meets their needs from a networking perspective, but can do so on this commodity hardware, um, that's kind of the perfect storm. And um, you know, there are companies out there doing that, but I, I don't know of very many that are currently inside of the operator space selling any function for all packet deployments built on Earth. And I just, when I look at the size of the scale problem they're facing, I think they need to rethink the technologies these are built on. And uh, um, unfortunately, they, they really put that onus on the vendors. And uh, that'd probably be the best place to start. Um, I also think what's going to happen is when, when the first sort of EPC solutions were introduced, it was literally an entire bulk packet core in a box. And they quickly realized they need to separate out those functions and treat them as separate systems just to be able to scale them independently. And I think that trend may continue. It may be that what is now the sort of, uh, sort of body of functions that people are implementing will have to get further uh, disaggregated into smaller functions to be able to scale effectively. Um, you know, it's, we're right in the middle of this problem today. Uh, you can go and read press uh, about what, how the operators are struggling and where their frustrations are. Um, you know, the U.S. is leading the charge in LTE right now, but as the rest of the world follows, you're, you're going to see the same sort of problems in, in other countries. Um, and, you know, you think Hundred million problem is challenging in the U.S. Imagine what you know China is going to suffer when they try to go LTE for their billions of people, um, or India. They have tremendous issues face there. You know they're going to be possibly in the one billion problems with respect to scale.